So, so essentially, it's been an interesting activity to actually try to focus much more on the upfront part of the system rather than the operational life of the building, but to at the same time keep in mind the operational life of the building and how it might be affected by what goes on in those early stages of the development. So that's the kind of uh, thrust of it. Uh, the, oops, where am I? Oh, hang on, this is, ah, right. Sorry, when I clicked a button there, it stopped my system working. Anyway, the second paper is uh, essentially, as I said, burrows down into thinking about a lot of aspects uh, in the design and development process that can have very long-term implications for the uh, appliances, uh, both both their operation and maintenance and so on. So they're, they're the, the sort of the topics that I've looked at. Um, I wanted to start first with something which is not covered in that much detail in the papers, but uh, I think that the climate issue is just so important. And in fact, one of my frustrations is that most public policy tends to focus on uh, annual greenhouse gas emissions. And we constantly hear this argument about whether or not Australia will meet its 2030 uh, Paris target and things like that. And I guess the, the fundamental issue to me is that the underlying driver of the climate problem is actually the very high concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is shown in the top graph on the right of this. And you can see that we're now up around 500 parts per million when we take into account all of the greenhouse gases. And uh, that's come up from a starting point a few hundred years ago of about 270. So from that point of view, uh, we have had a big growth and you can see that it's skyrocketed in, in recent years. Um, the, the lower graph talks about what's called radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases. And again, the key thing is that what the greenhouse gases are doing is absorbing energy that was going to leave the earth and then re-radiating back uh, part of it to the earth. So it is effective like, like increasing the intensity of the radiation of the sun. And again, that's showing uh, the similar sorts of trends that we've had. Um, another way of looking at the issue, which I think is, is also useful, is what we call the carbon budget approach. And essentially, this is what highlights just what a challenge we have, because uh, to remain within the 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, temperature rise, plus or minus a bit, uh, we've only got seven years worth of emissions at, at the present level of global uh, emission production. Uh, so we, are, we really, really have to change fast. And this means not just reducing emissions, this means shutting down emissions and extracting greenhouse gases from the Earth's atmosphere. The other point on the, the far left slide is just that the vast bulk of global greenhouse gas emissions are essentially associated with our burning of fossil fuels. Now, the sorts of implications that we need to think about, uh, if we look at the temperature of the Earth you know, on average, it's it's a normal distribution. Um, so we have a few hot days, a few cold days, and a lot of days in the middle. And the thing is that we have already shifted that the mean or the average about a degree or so. And in doing that, you can see what happens is that the percentage of hot days goes up much more than you might expect just by looking at a little change in the average. And that's, of course, because we're going up that steep slope of the normal distribution curve. So the problem we've got is that if we have another degree or so of warming, we are going to have another doubling on top of the quadrupling that we've already got of hot days. And that has enormous implications for many aspects of our buildings. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with, with all of these. But keep in mind, we're trying to design our buildings to last 50 or 100 years. And so we need to plan ahead when we look at the kinds of challenges that we might face. Um, 
with, for example, um, bushfires becoming more intense and over wider areas. There are other things too. Our, all of our infrastructure is becoming more stressed and both individuals and societies are facing serious financial impacts uh, as uh, land use changes. There's also the deep psychological problems that we're starting to face. And I think the COVID experience that we've had about uncertainty uh, is really just a warmer for what the sorts of things that a lot of people in a lot of parts of the world are going to be dealing with. Lastly, of course, businesses are facing serious supply chain issues of all kinds, uh, both with their own supply chains, but with government policy changes, and also, of course, with consumer expectations. So there's, there's an awful lot uh, going to change in the next few years. Looking at Australia's residential greenhouse gas emissions, the, the three main bits are uh, transport, which uh, is an important thing to think about when we're deciding where we're building uh, a house and, and how we're building it. Uh, then electricity and the last bit, the blue bit, is essentially everything else of which about two thirds is gas and the rest is wastes and refrigerants and bits and pieces like that. Um, embodied energy uh, and emissions is not built into the, the official government uh, forecasts and data. So I've, I've pulled out some work uh, done by um, Australians estimating the emissions uh, associated with residential construction at about 20 million tonnes. So you can see that's actually bigger than the gas and everything else part. So embodied emissions is already a big issue and it's going to become much bigger uh, as we reduce the emissions from electricity and, and uh, electrified transport. So um, there are some good things. The EPIC database is a very useful resource and has lots of documents as well as the data. And also there's a really exciting new partnership of, uh, if you like, a customer alliance that's been, been led by the World Wildlife Fund um, called MECLA. And I think that is going to be quite a powerful force in the marketplace. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big things is lots of organisations and individuals are trying to achieve net emissions or beyond. And the Council of Australian Governments, which has now got a different name, um, did have a big agreement in which uh, they committed to develop trajectories towards what I find a bit, a bit disappointing, really, net zero emission and energy ready buildings, right? So we're going to go for net emissions and we're going to be not achieving net emissions, we're going to be ready, whatever that means. Um, and so the policy area is a very busy space at the moment and there's a lot of good work being done but it is very much focused on uh, operating emissions and there are all of the usual tensions we see in the building industry between not doing too much and uh, being leaders and of course really if we step back uh, we do see a lot of uh, other views about what we should be achieving and we need to think about, are we thinking about life cycle emissions, transport emissions? Um, and for example, the government, the Australian government runs a, a very good program called Climate Active, where they provide guidelines for doing carbon audits and things like, and things like that. And um, they say that we should include what they call significant scope three emissions. And scope three emissions are the indirect emissions such as our transport and our air travel and the um, other associated major things in, in, and can include food as well. Uh, also, a lot of people are trying to restore our environment and that is can be built in as part of this as well. Um, then once we start looking at the practicalities of managing energy demand, we can see we have serious issues with peak, de peak demand. Uh, we have new technologies like energy storage uh, appearing. And of course, there's lots of other emissions. Uh, as we move more towards heat pumps, I think there'll be much more focus on uh, natural refrigerants and low global warming potential refrigerants. 
on a positive front, the architects are out there with the Architects Declare program, and I'm sure AIA people can tell you much more than I can about that. Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting is that the expectations and the accountability uh, of professionals and tradespeople working in the building space are increasing, and not just on climate and energy. Um, uh, Bronwyn Weir spoke in one of these sessions recently about, about the work on fire safety and, and uh, quality of building and things like that. So we're seeing a lot of stuff happening. One area that's quite a useful example of um, the kind of accountability issue that's emerging is the Victorian uh, Residential Efficiency Scorecard, which uh, at the moment is voluntary and there are trained assessors who can look at this and they essentially look at the building envelope as built, uh, they inspect it, and also the major fixed appliances and equipment like lighting uh, and rooftop solar. And you get a rating on that, on those things. And also there is actually a summer performance rating too. And this is a response to the feedback that the government got that people are becoming increasingly concerned about uh, summer performance of homes uh, and not just comfort, but indeed health. Um, now, it's likely, well, it's likely that this will be national and it's also likely that over time it will become mandatory. And of course, the Australian Capital Territory have had a mandatory uh, star rating requirement for existing homes for 20 years or so. Um, and the neighbours rating scheme has been mandatory for commercial buildings or at least office buildings for over a decade now. And it, these types of disclosure schemes have been useful, not just in terms of encouraging people to upgrade buildings, but if you are building a new building and not keeping an eye on what its future rating might look like, then you are at risk of uh, not necessarily getting as much for, for sale of your property uh, as you might have hoped. So these are powerful forces that are starting to play. Um, this slide just shows an excerpt of a table from the first of my, the papers. And essentially uh, this, you can see from the approach here, it, it looks at location and site, which highlights transport and uh, land clearing issues, uh, embodied emissions, operating emissions, and right through to end of life uh, and unavoidable impacts. And what I've tried to do here is give some practical examples of the sorts of things that could be incorporated by designers into clauses in contracts or formal procedures for managing things or is uh, to be a focus of inspections or monitoring um, and which could also be used as criteria when you're selecting your team. Um, and these are all the kinds of strategies that a designer um, can bring to bear to influence all of these areas. Um, again, we're seeing a lot of change in the building area, and I, I thought it was useful to talk a little bit about apartments as an example of that. Um, really, the, the large apartment buildings that we're now seeing in many parts of, of Australia are relatively recent, and they are very different projects from the kinds of traditional residential projects that we've had. Um, and we, I think, are still struggling to uh, address some of the issues that they, they have. And at the same time, I think they also reflect some important uh, issues that are, that are emerging. Um, so this is just one of a couple of case studies that, that are in the, the paper. And you can see that, in fact, the biggest contributor to the emissions of this particular uh, high-rise apartment building was domestic hot water. Uh, appliances was, and cooking were pretty big, lights were fairly big, uh, ventilation and heating and cooling also. But um, this highlights the existence of centralised uh, energy systems in these buildings, which can be very different from uh, the traditional residential. Another thing that's really standing out with um, apartment buildings is we are getting a lot of complaints about overheating 
uh, apartments. Uh, and to some extent, there's a clear tension here between uh, getting excessive solar gain versus the views and the daylight that people want in these buildings. Um, and of course, often these buildings are purchased by someone who never plans to live in them. So they don't actually think too much about some of these issues. We're also seeing increasing challenges with humidity, condensation, water vapour and indoor air quality uh, not just in apartments, but more widely as we build tighter, uh, thermally better buildings. Thermal bridging, I think, is a much under-recognised issue in Australia. And when you start looking at the heat flows from a concrete balcony that feed into the building via the concrete slab, you look at the thermal bridging as the concrete slab uses the brick walls above and below it as a thermal, uh, as a fin. Um, there's a lot more here than uh, most people have looked at yet in Australia. Um, and obviously noise is an issue. Another really important thing is that once we move beyond walk-up apartments, um, people start thinking about, oh, what if the power fails and I'm on the 20th floor um, and the air conditioning goes off and the lifts fail? So there's really interesting questions here about the resilience that we might have to face. We're also seeing very different kind of business models. We're seeing, uh, for example, central hot water systems where people are being charged quite high fixed charges to be connected on top of electricity charges and things like that. Uh, we're seeing exciting development models, uh, such as the, the Nightingale one, which has attracted a bit of media recently. Um, but uh, we're seeing new ways of doing things. We're seeing much more interest in access to open space, I think, after the COVID. Um, and as we're starting to get a wider variety of households with families and, and uh, other groups moving into apartments, there's also concern about amenity. And I think one of the challenges I think I've found with some people in this space is this concept that I just want to build the building and get the average building performance good. Um, and I think the message I've had from quite a lot of buyers and tenants is actually I'm thinking of my apartment as my home and I expect my home to perform at the sort of level that uh, a detached house would have. Um, so this is where um, trying to allow trade-offs between different apartments can be a challenge uh, in terms of uh, consumer acceptance. Uh, and of course, building quality I've already touched on. Uh, adaptable homes, I think, are increasingly important. And I, I visited some friends in London. I thought they were very rich until I realised they only owned the ground floor of the three-storey uh, building they were in. There's also been uh, a project I was involved with, Habitat 21, uh, led to a display village of four homes near Dandenong, where we were playing around with how can you create a home where maybe people could uh, share part of the building before they have a family or could have a multi-generational uh, group of people living in a home. And I think this sort of adaptability is going to be really important. If we're looking at house energy ratings and uh, we use the neighbours rating tool, um, this graph just shows you how the uh, thermal energy performance on an annual basis per square metre varies as the star rating uh, changes. And we certainly see that our, the six star regulatory level that we've got today is a lot better or a lot less bad, many people might say, than uh, it, the older homes that we have. And of course, this creates a, a challenge because we've got a lot of old, poor performing homes and we've got a lot of new homes that work really differently from, from the old ones. At the same time, um, our standards are not all that high. One of the uh, unfortunate kind of consequences of the way we've approached our house rating, which is using an annual star rating or megajoule per square metre thermal energy number, is that in a lot of climates um, that are cooler, uh, you can get the problem that uh, 
the building may work really well in winter, but very badly in summer, because essentially people can get up to the six star regulation level by focusing on winter building performance. And indeed, a dark roof and no eaves can improve your star rating in some climate zones, which is kind of uh, a bit perverse. And that's where in the 2019 building code, uh, there was a bit of a change where in at least some climate zones, they are now requiring not only the annual uh, energy performance, but also separate summer and winter performance requirements. And this is the beginnings of confronting this problem of poor performance in summer. And I, I think that can only become a bigger issue over time. Another thing about the rating tools is that they do an hourly simulation of zones in the building or even separate rooms in the building uh, as part of the rating. And it's possible to access the data on that. And so you can actually look at uh, you can select, you know, a hot period, a cold period, and you can look room by room or zone by zone at the free running performance of those parts of the building. And I think this is a much underused design technique because you can start to see which building, which part of the building is going to work well or badly when, and you can play around with the design. So I think that in a sense, the separation between rating and design is unfortunate. I think they should be much better integrated. And of course, the, the leading people are doing that, but I think we need to see more of it. Glazing is an enormous issue. And uh, if you look at the insulation value of glazing, even pretty good glazing uh, compared with bulk insulation in a wall, is very poor insulation. And a single glazed window, if there's a lot of air movement over the inside uh, film of air, also is pretty poor. Um, and I think we are going to have to do a lot more thinking about glazing. And I'll, I'll give a bit of a plug for uh, low emissivity coated double glazing, because uh, the common name for low E coatings is heat mirror. And uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, basically a low E double glazed window compared with a standard double glazed window actually has a significantly warmer indoor temperature and can be provide much, much higher level of comfort than you might expect. So I'm a bit of a fan of that. We also have to think about uh, peak demand. Uh, as I said, we're confronting uh, extreme increases and the peaks are when the electricity system is at greatest risk. The grey parts here show the heating and cooling are the dominant issues, but there's also cooking in winter, appliances and so on are, are big issues as well. Okay, so now I'll move on to the, my, the second paper, which starts to get into a bit more nerdy stuff, I guess you could say. Um, but I think this is also where you might think as you're designing, where am I putting provision for the dishwasher or the fridge? How much space am I leaving? How long are the pipes? There are a lot of issues here that really are significant for the lifetime of the building uh, and that we, we need to look at. Um, just again, to put some context, if we look at the Australian level, unfortunately, our Australian data is not very new. Um, the most recent data we have is from 2014. Um, the people who did this study are working on an updated analysis of residential uh, energy use, but um, again, this just reflects a serious problem in Australia that we have a lack of focus on the demand side of energy. Um, everyone's so captured by getting excited about renewable energy and arguing about whether it's good enough or not and gas and all those things. The, the issue is we, we need better data on the, the demand side. But you can see in broad terms uh, how the electricity and gas are being used. Um, 
and that appliances, uh, electric appliances are quite a big issue, which is why there's a separate pie chart here, uh, just looking at the breakdown of the electrical appliances. And you can see fridges are big and uh, televisions and general IT are pretty big. But one of the interesting things to me though, is that this is overall uh, emissions, not each individual home. And so when we look here and we look at say apartment common areas at 4% of residential emissions, pool uh, electricity, sorry, uh, appliance usage, sorry, um, and pool electricity at 8%, what you've got to keep in mind, is only about 10% of homes have a pool. Um, so if you have a pool, your pool is pretty big as an issue for you to think about. On the other hand, if we look at clothes dryers at 1%, um, what this tends to suggest is, oh, 3%, whatever, um, what we've got to remember here is that some people might be using a clothes dryer very intensively for a few years while they've got young kids, and then the clothes dryer is just sitting there not being used very much. And the average usage, which is what shows up in this pie chart, is actually not very frequent use of clothes dryers, but people who have certain circumstances can really use them very heavily. Uh, again, the framework of the paper is really uh, trying to unravel, you know, who delivers what, uh, what kinds of issues maybe can the designer influence uh, in the roles that they play uh, where they make decisions or they select people or equipment or they, um, they are part of a project team. Uh, they're interacting with a client. So there's all of these opportunities to influence uh, a whole range of issues uh, from, you know, electric wiring, uh, from selection of are we going to go with gas or all electric? And there's a whole lot of issues that, that you guys are a part of. Uh, and again, I guess an issue for me that is a bit frustrating is that lots of people, I think, see rooftop solar as a uh, silver bullet. And let's be clear, rooftop solar is fantastic, but it's not a silver bullet. And this graph shows that even in December, you can get in Melbourne some pretty low solar days. And of course, in winter, you have a much lower solar radiation on average. And so we, we need to factor these things in. Uh, and this is going to have some interesting implications for, for the orientation and sloping, for example, of our solar panels as, we, as they become cheaper. Um, there's going to be a lot of interesting change here. And at the same time, the best solution to me is to take an integrated approach. And that's where you start with efficient, flexible, smart, connected equipment. Um, because that minimizes the amount of energy supply infrastructure you'll need and it gives you maximum resilience because a good building won't cook you very quickly um, like a bad building will. Um, so from that point of view, uh, integration is really important. And the exciting thing is there are just so many options which I've kind of flagged there with um, energy storage and on-site renewables and new business models for power purchase agreements. There's just so much happening, it's amazing. And we could spend hours talking about just those things, which we're not going to do. Uh, there's also significant trends in the performance of appliances. And this is my attempt to look at the stock performance uh, in 2014 and 19, and then what what could you achieve if you bought the best products on the market? So the grey bar is showing you that there's still quite a lot of potential in a lot of areas um, to cut your emissions and electricity use uh, if you make good choices of the best appliances and if people use them fairly sensibly. Um, I won't go through these, but these are sort of my wish list of all of the sorts of uh, techniques and policies and things that we might apply uh, if we were to achieve um, the sort of performance that I think we should we should see as normal. Uh, a key 
thing for us is information. And one of the important sources of information is in fact the appliance labeling program that I, I was involved with in the 80s. And I, I declare that we, um, we just stole the star rating from the hotel scheme because uh, we wanted something people understood and it's worked. Um, the thing is, you can see on the right there that quite a lot of products now carry energy labels, which is good. Uh, and they do make a big difference because each extra star, depending on the product, can be 15 to 30% improvement in energy performance. So a star is worth quite a bit. Um, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that some of the scales have run out of stars because the traditional label is a six star label for which, by the way, the first star you get uh, if it meets all of the safety requirements. So there's sort of one star, then five stars for performance. Um, but we now, uh, if you go over the five stars, you are now entitled to have what they call the coronet of up to 10 stars. Um, and if you're buying a television or uh, a, a clothes dryer, the best of the products are up in the sort of eight stars, nine, 10 stars range. And so a four-star TV is actually pretty bad, um, whereas a five-star fridge is the best pretty much you'll get on the market at the moment. So you, that's where you should look at the consumption numbers to look at the real issues, and also you should look at the rate uh, at the uh, website to see what are the most pro most efficient products in a given area. Um, there's a new label being phased in for uh, reverse cycle air conditioners, which has three climate zones because we recognise that uh, reverse cycle air conditioners work better or not so, no, so well in different climates. Um, also, one of the traps for beginners is that they have actually adjusted the rating scales in a number of uh, products, particularly fridges and reverse cycle air conditioners. So, uh, I have friends with a 1990s fridge, which has got a five star label on it, which is actually one and a half stars in today's uh, rating. Not so fantastic. Um, so that's useful. Choice magazine um, in the fine print of their comparison tables have quite a lot of good energy data. And of course your home is a very good resource as well. Um, again, the paper goes into a fair bit of kind of practical detail of getting things right um, with selecting appliances, thinking about peak demand that might be uh, occurring if you put the wrong appliances in, um, recognising that, for example, some appliances have quite high standby losses. Um, if you use them a lot, that may not matter much, but if you're a small household, that can be really important. Um, long pipes uh, can be an issue, uh, poor user interfaces, uh, all, all sorts of issues are there to be thought about and I've tried to discuss as many as I can. The picture here shows one of my bugbears which is about poor user interfaces and in this case this is a mixer tap and if you look really closely you can see a red dot and a blue dot but most people who use that tap have no idea what they're doing. Um, and one of the other things about mixer taps is that you often end up in a situation where uh, if you've got the lever in the middle, you will actually be drawing off water from the hot water supply, except it will have cooled down in the pipes, uh, as well as the cold supply. So you're actually wasting hot water um, as, and, and taking longer to get the hot water to you if you do do that approach. Um, Condensation issues are enormous. And I think I just to touch one here, the, the heat pump clothes dry, I think is, is a really important development because even when people dry their clothes on a rack in the house, they are releasing all of the water vapor from those clothes into the room. Um, and we're increasingly having mold and all sorts of issues here. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are struggling with this, but to be honest, I think a lot of occupants of homes just have no idea uh, how much water vapour they are creating by their day-to-day -day activities. So there's an education issue here as well. Um, just finishing off, uh, another resource that I find quite useful is Sanctuary Magazine, because at the end of each story, they actually uh, list 
a lot of the components and features that have been built into each of the houses, and they even include, in many cases, the project team that were involved in them. Um, so I find that a very useful uh, place to sort of check out who's doing what and what kinds of products and equipments and uh, items are being used. And so I'll stop there and open for discussion and questions and answer. Thanks, Alan. Um, very comprehensive overview of both of those Acumen practice notes. I'm a complete sinner for a lot of that stuff that you've mentioned, especially about drying clothes indoors and all those sort of things. Just taking a look at my TV and the background and, and a fridge and all those sort of things. Some really interesting questions have come through on chat too. So let's kick off with those. Maybe um, what we'll do, if that's all right, Alan, just get you to stop sharing your PowerPoint presentation screen and we'll just bring you up a little bit bigger on the, on the camera lens, if that's okay for us. Stop sharing. Right. Good stuff. All right. So let's kick off with some of the questions. Um, and I'm just going to bring up um, a few questions that have been emailed to me, both in the chat and also um, through my email. You were talking firstly about residential scorecards likely to go national. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think residential scorecards are designed to be mandatory at the time of sale or lease of a resi property? Well, it depends who you talk to. Um, the, uh, Internationally and with the Neighbours Scheme, it's quite clear that making uh, disclosure mandatory is a really important thing to do because basically if it's not mandatory, people who've got poor performing buildings and, you know, maybe landlords and people like that just won't bother. So there is a, there is a strong case for mandatory. Um, the reality is that... Uh, there has been a lot of pushback from some groups against mandatory disclosure in residential, uh, which is why the, the, the office building and the residential things were both agreed at about the same time by the Council of Australian Governments. But surprise, surprise, one of them's gone ahead like a rocket ship and the other one has not. Um, so my understanding is that um, the a, a staged approach is being taken. So the Victorian government has developed a product. Uh, it has been trialled in, in most other states, and I think there's general feeling that it probably works okay. Um, and the issue is that they want to build up uh, a base of trained assessors and build familiarity uh, before anyone starts really saying this will be mandatory. But I think if you look at, say, for example, the ACT, the ACT's had a mandatory program for 20 years. I can't see, and they're pretty keen on, you know, carbon reduction and equity and things like that. So I, I would think it would not be a large step, for example, for ACT to go mandatory with the new tool. Um, and I think the reality is, you know, all of this building stuff, even the so-called National Construction Code is actually regulated state by state. And so I think the answer will be that it will depend on which state you're in uh, as to how quickly it might become mandatory or whether it might be linked to incentives of some kinds or something like that or, or access to finance to do an upgrade or, you know, there, there's a whole range of ways you can drive it, but this is the direction things are going. I think that's the key message. Mm. It is interesting. I mean, you talk about the NCC, but you, you're right, actually. It does have the word national in the title, but yet it is very much predicated on where you actually reside across the country. Interesting point. Let's talk about the code and, and I suppose catching up with the tightening up of thermal envelopes in, in terms of in conjunction with addressing condensation issues and those sort of things. Do you think the code's catching up to that, that kind of stuff? Uh, it's catching up. I think the question is whether it's catching up fast enough and whether tradespeople are being skilled up fast enough. Uh, I mean, I think all, also, I mean, it's the, the products that are available and the advice coming from the manufacturers of materials and products is all, also a kind of a moving feast. So, I mean, I think the reality we face is that um, 
we had such leaky buildings for so long that we just never really confronted a lot of the issues that have been confronted in a lot of other places around the world for a long time. Um, so the good news is there's lots of good information for us to catch up to. Uh, and uh, the national, the ABCB, the Building Codes Board, has issued a condensation handbook. Uh, and my understanding is that there's a fair bit of work going towards the 2022 National Construction Code that will drive the, the dealing with condensation and things like that harder. Because I think one of the other interesting uh, kind of forces that has emerged in the last maybe three years, has been groups like the Australian Council of Social Services and Energy Consumers Australia, Brotherhood of St Lawrence, and a whole bunch of groups who have, I think, transformed the energy, the, the building energy regulatory debate and shifted it from arguments about how much energy and how much is it worth to people wanting safe, healthy, comfortable homes that are affordable to live in. And that, that has changed the fundamental debates a lot, I think. Um, so that's, that's, that's why, again, you know, people are looking, people are expecting a lot more from the building industry and the designers than I think they have in the past, because that's, that's where the debate's gone. Let's, uh, this is the final question that we've really got. And it was, it's come off the chat box. And this is really interesting. You've seen over COVID, I suppose, that a lot of people being stuck at home and, you know, with lockdowns and stuff have invaded JB Hi-Fi, have gone to Harvey Norman and have bought the latest flat screen and have, you know, upgraded all of their white goods and stuff like that. And a couple of questions have come through, really interesting ones, one from Belinda, one from Michelle. The balance between replacing and updating old appliances, those ones that might only have a low star rating, with those new ones that seem to feature, you know, five or six stars in terms of embodied and operational emissions. Michelle raises this point and she's saying, are we consuming more in terms of, you know, goods and services, or I suppose, you know, actual white goods, et cetera, in order to save energy? And what's the trade-off there? You know, built-in obsolescence, she says, is a real issue, and that's absolutely correct. It would be good, her comment is, more of those appliance makers have a recycling buyback scheme where you can bring back old appliances for a discount on the new ones that you purchase. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well, in fact, in the second paper, I, I, I have a case study I think it's the second one. One of the papers, <laughs> uh, I have a case study of a fridge, in fact, and um, point out that uh, the embodied emissions associated with a fridge are actually only equivalent to the savings over a couple of years if you are replacing an inefficient old fridge with a new one. Now, uh, as, as I also point out, if you recycled it properly, <laughs> then the payback period would be less. But certainly um, you, you start to see really like where, where you're getting a substantial energy saving. And we do get that when we're replacing a lot of older appliances like old fridges, old TVs, things like that. There's, there's a pretty clear cut net benefit and that net benefit is improved if you reprocess and recycle it properly. Um, as, you know, as the gap between the new and the replacement one gets smaller and smaller, obviously the, the payback does get longer. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the nature of the world. But um, again, one of the interesting things, um, again, uh, for instance, Apple have uh, documentation on all their products on their on their website showing the life cycle em, uh, emissions, including you know the embodied and and the um, system level and and the user emissions. And once you start looking at, I mean, if you're using an iPad or you know note note notepad kind of device to watch TV instead of a normal television, you are way ahead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's, there's interesting things about uh, people's behaviour and preferences and things, you know. 
It's um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people are swayed very much by the introduction of that rating system, and and marketers have maybe learnt to um, use it to their advantage. Perhaps who knows? There's an interesting comment. This is from Marley Dawson. I think Marley, you're a gardener, architects from memory. She uh, Marley says, look, in our firm, we ask the same questions when retaining and extending existing homes rather than de- uh, demolishing and 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 having more of a demand on new materials. And Marley says it's always challenging to receive the required star rating when retaining existing infrastructure, even though we'd classify it as a more sustainable approach. Um, another question that's come through from Belinda, and that's just in relation to our slow adoption of all electric um, appliances and things like that in terms of motor vehicles and, and we've especially seen it I suppose with hybrid cars and now moving towards more electric vehicles do you see the same sort of thing happening in a residential setting well I think I think it depends a lot on which state you're in uh, I mean if we look at Victoria the reality is you know something 80 85 percent of Victorian homes are connected to gas and we have a deep culture and we have an industrial base that is focused on delivering gas appliances and gas supply and all of those things. Whereas, you know, in some other states, gas is much less common, obviously the most extreme is Tasmania. Um, And a lot of rural and regional areas and a lot of areas where where people are moving to, for example, in in response to COVID, (laughs) um, they haven't got access to, to grid gas. So there's a lot of transformation going on towards the electric technologies. And I, I really think it, it is going to depend on, uh, you know, what area you live in and what's available for you. And also at what point you are in the investment process, because I mean, Renew and the Grattan Institute have both done studies showing that basically an all electric new home does seem to make sense because even though, say, the heat pump hot water service might be a bit more expensive than the gas one, um, if you need cooling, which increasingly we do, or we think we do, um, then once you buy an air conditioner, the difference in cost between a cooling only one and a, and a reverse cycle one that is a free heater uh, is, is pretty much nothing. So a gas heating system is kind of competing with a free heater. Uh, so once, and, and of course, you're avoiding gas pipes and various other components as well. So once, if you're looking at a new home, I think there's a clearer distinction uh, about what you would do. The challenges really come with existing homes where, again, you know, the point we talked about, I've got a perfectly good gas ducted heating system and I quite like that. Um, do I change that or not and I mean these are these are tricky questions and everyone's gonna have their own decisions Uh, but I think the um, I mean the gas industry is now starting to talk about um, having kind of pilot hydrogen or biomethane uh, facilities to service some new housing developments or to blend in with existing gas supply and I think they're optimistic that that will stem the tide towards electrification. But I think when you do the numbers still, it's not going to stack up too well compared with all electric for, for new homes. But we're going to, it's, it's a bit like, you know, we've got a lot of thermally poor old buildings and we're going to have a transition as we upgrade or replace all of those in the same way the, the appliance story will be similar, but probably just happen a bit faster. Okay, final question, Alan. Um, I suppose the 2030 is not that far away. Uh, and there seems to be, you know, a huge push to have, you know, a much more reduced um, carbon output. Do you think Australia is on track to, to meet its objectives by 2030 and say 2050? Well, well, as I said in my talk, I think that the harsh reality is we have to pretty much go to zero net emissions like very, very fast. <laughs> so we're nowhere near what we need to be doing. And I think there's there's also uh, a strong argument that we are a wealthy country and we have emitted a lot and we export a lot of emissions. And so I think we have a much bigger responsibility than a lot of other countries. 
And on that basis, we're, no, we're not even on the right page, to be blunt. <laughs> um, but I think the other issue is, uh, you know, there's significant numbers of scientists who, who really see it as becoming increasingly difficult globally to, to limit warming below two degrees, um, let alone the one and a half that is the Paris commitment. And yeah, look, Australia is a laggard by pretty much every criterion I can find. Um, but um, yeah, you know, this, this is the way politics in Australia has played out. Um, and we have to keep in mind that really, look, Bob, Bob Hawke and uh, Kevin Rudd were really, uh, well, and Julie Gillard, were the only three prime ministers we've had since 1990 or since the late 80s who actually were in any way serious about climate action from what I can see. Mm. Okay. All right, Alan, we will leave it there. Thank you very much for your um, authorship of those two Acumen content papers. They are really interesting reading. I would commend those of you on the call to have a good look through them. If you've got access to Acumen, they are really fascinating. So thank you very much, Alan, for those two papers and also for presenting today. I certainly um, will give you credit. You have a very packed PowerPoint presentation slide. There's plenty to look at in every slide that you put on the screen. Um, and so it was a really fantastic opportunity just to find out more uh, in depth, I suppose, um, in relation to um, appliances, especially in those resi settings. So thanks very much for your time. Um, that is it for today, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed the last 50 minutes or so of Alan's presentation, and hopefully it's been of interest and benefit to you. And um, just want to say, keep your eyes peeled for another member webinar. No doubt we'll do another one soon once we release further Acuma notes. And um, until that time, do stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much for joining, and enjoy the rest of your day. See you later.